I'm very pleased to say that sat with me are Jimmy and Yanis, and you're going to talk us through the whole album. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, we yes. are. How are you both doing? Uh, yeah, very good. Had a nice sort of frustrating hour-long cab ride through <laughs> London. Yeah, um, trying to get here. Gridlock. But yeah, yeah well, no, we're excited for, yeah, the album's coming out. Yeah. And it is out. It is out. Yeah. It's officially it's out. out. It's, it's finally the, out. It, life is yours is ours yeah. now. Yeah. No, yes. Yeah. 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 Which is very exciting. And and it's a kind of a nice, in a way, gentle introduction to the record, Life is Yours, in a way. Um, but it does keep this whole kind of groove going that runs throughout the album. And it's a very percussive-led record approaching this album. What did you want to do? What did you think? I think you know we 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 wanted to make um, a record that was yeah percussive and rhythmic and was um, dancier um, and um, the maybe some of what had come before um, and had a, a like a tighter focus so like a more cohesive um, record that from track one to track ten or eleven um, there was like a DNA that was shared through the record in a way that perhaps on other records we've we've tried to actively do the opposite. Um, on this one, we thought this would be the one where it should share a kind of coherency through the through the whole through the whole album. Yeah, um, and I think lots of the lots of the lots of the record can be heard within the song "Life Is Yours." So it felt like the perfect opener, really. I think so. Lots of little bits that in "Life Is Yours" that are across the whole album. So that that is almost like the theme tune. You could say, yeah, yeah. or the there's a proper term for this in terms uh, of title track and musical. <laughs> yeah, well, it is <laughs> yeah, the title yeah, right. track, Space maker or something like that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, well, there's like a, certainly from my world on that song, like the keyboards and generally like the writing for this album, it's like tried to keep it simple in a, in a, and make that a challenging thing to do, which was good. So like certainly with like the sort of life is yours is a good example of like keyboard chords where it's like I sort of it's like a mistake basically, but I just it sounded cool, so I just did it over and over and over again, like, like totally naive, you know. And I asked someone, who was it? Uh, uh, Hugh Brunt from the, the LCO. Yeah. Uh, and um, I was just like, oh, what is that? You know, and he was like, that's nothing. I was like, that's nothing like cool and musical. He's like, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's a just a triad with a fourth. Yeah, he's a triad with something. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically a mistake. <laughs> but, so that, that was kind of my approach to the whole thing was like, don't think about it too much. And just like, if it feels good, then it is good kind of thing. Yeah. And so are you all multitasking more than you would have done in the past? I mean, this is the new slimmed down version of false uh, the, the three yeah. piece yeah i think it, it started to happen on the last record anyway on, the, on that whole writing process um because um edwin was writing some stuff but not 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 all the time um so we'd started to kind of fan out a bit more um and then on this it probably yeah even more so and i think that one big difference was probably like jimmy was on keyboards as a main instrument more than normal yeah um, so, so often when we were writing, it would be keyboard, one guitar, um, and then the, and I'd be doing the guitar, and often that would double up as the bass because I, you know, with some trickery, I could just move s seamlessly into bass territory. Um, yeah, but it, it changed. It meant that there was more space in the songwriting. Now Jack's obviously doing the drums. But um, yeah, but yeah, definitely. I forgot about that. Yeah, like uh, yeah. So say like I'm in a room and I'm just playing keyboards and Yanis's guitar and there's drums. I'm just like, well, that's it then. I'm not going to play guitar. Really, unless you, oh, yeah, unless you know, it's like because what we'd normally do is we'd just go in and I'd put loads of keyboards down, then throw loads, of, you know, overdub, loads of overdubs all the time, and it's like you end up in this situation where what you're hearing is not actually what was going on in the room at all. Yeah. So it's cool to try and keep it like that, like like simple, you know, like here's one guitar overdub, you know, the sum of its parts kind of thing, and then and that that was good because it, we had this lovely spe like sparse foundation which we could then go work with these producers and they had all this room to work with and yeah it was cool, yeah. helpful in like shaping the whole thing and making it cohesive definitely yeah and a, and a big departure i mean when yeah. you're so tied to one particular instrument yeah well i mean i've always played keyboards quietly in the right <laughs> but i had to be a bit wary with edwin because obviously i didn't want to trample on his flowers right but, yeah uh, you know i'd always try and sneak in any any like spare second on any album i'd fill in with loads of keyboards <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no it was really nice just to like choose one or the other really yeah yeah and so the album was begun in peckham in the studio space or rehearsal space you have there but then you took it to various different people yeah. to continue working on the songs yes so basically you know obviously we were writing in lockdown so for the for, for for the initial period we were kind of separate jimmy was in the states 
I was at home, Jack was, you know, in his house. We weren't we weren't together and we were kind of having a break and we didn't obviously know, you know, whether we were gonna be writing a record. We thought maybe we would be back on tour before we kinda knew it. But obviously as it as it as the pandemic kind of increased in severity and duration, it was like, okay. So we sent some stuff around and then eventually Jim came back and we and we yeah, we were in Peckham in this um in, in a different writing room than we had used before and actually kind of a more um, Spartan, more private. I mean, really no frills. Um, and no one was around in Peckham. Nothing was open, obviously. So we just had these, key, these keys to the studio. We'd go down there and we wouldn't, we literally wouldn't see anyone. There was like, you could get one takeaway coffee um, from one place and there was just nothing else going on, which was weird because obviously, in, you know, Peckham's pretty bustling and stuff. And, um, so we were there and then, yeah, we would just work on music kind of privately um, and we just wrote and wrote a lot of stuff. And then I think we started to feel like we wanted to, there was a couple of things that went on, but that we wanted to start trying to record and demo essentially. And we weren't sure who we wanted to work with. And obviously there was limitations with COVID about how people could get together and work. So, so that kind of... Um, f- fueled some of the process so yeah we would go to we would record it in conk in north london with miles james who's an amazing producer uh we worked with ak paul um in peckham we worked with remotely with john hill in la and we worked with dan carey and streatham so we had these four producers um often they would work on the same track one would start one would take over sometimes we we would only have two produ- you know we we had different combos yeah, according to what the song was and what we felt like, and we would sub- add and subtract as we liked. So we kind of retained the control um, in a way that was exciting because it meant you could you could you could throw a song into somebody's um, arena and then have them do whatever they want to do to it. But then at the end of the day, you'd be like, well, actually, I preferred this aspect of the way it was before. And there was a kind of um, I don't know, it was just playful and kind of f- quite free. Yeah. And then we did a bunch of those, and they they would be light sessions. We'd go in two days, you know, and we'd come out with what maybe th- three demos. Certainly with Dan, we worked quickly. There was well, there was absolutely there was no pressure on anything because at that point, there, no one knew what was going on. No one knew if like there would be any live music ever again, and there was certainly no demand for a release of an album whatsoever. So it was lovely in the fact that we could luxuriate a little bit in like. Yeah, allowing these people the time yeah. to actually work on the record. And then they ended up kind of choosing sort of which ones they wanted to work on anyway. It, it, it shuffled out nicely into the different camps. And uh, I think, yeah, we had a sort of a nice, even though we didn't really use all the time we had, like it was yeah. a luxurious amount. Just having yeah. no pressure meant that we could really like sort of blaze a trail down the road without having worrying about any obstacles or anything like that. And, and is this 2021? Or is uh, this 2020? Yeah, 2021. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Well, at the tail end of 2020. Yeah. Like start, we started writing September 2020. Yeah, I'm bad with dates. Yeah, well, it's all yeah. a bit weird now. Isn't um, it? Well, it, well, it must be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so who lo- who worked on Life Is Yours with you then? Uh, that was Mar- that was Miles James. So that the, the body of that was tracked in Conk. And then... And then, so what What did happen as well is that we did, re, so when things opened up, we went to real world studios in the countryside outside Bath, Peter Gabriel's studio. And we had John Hill actually join us physically from LA. We had Miles James there. We had Dan Carey for, for occasionally. And we, we had the bones of the album ready, but that we relocated there to do focused work. So, so say, say Life Is Yours, it was started in Conk in London and left 70% finished. And then we went there and like we we rewrote the chorus and I did all the vocals and stuff like that. So we would, we kind of made everything cohere like in real world and made sure that there was a kind of sonic fingerprint across the whole thing because otherwise it could have probably felt a bit too disparate. Yeah, yeah, sure. So that kind of brought it all together. And with life is yours as the Song. title. Song, song yeah um is is it the message no that, that is this like reclaiming life after a period when life has been closed down or the future has been so uncertain as you say jimmy now will there be live music again will will things return to normal is, is it like that yeah in a way i mean i think that having like an optimistic statement you know in defiance of like all of the darkness and the bleakness that was the 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 atmosphere around the record when it was being written is cool like i think it was nice to have a kind of big positive um statement and you know it it comes from the lyric within the song which is kind of more of a private piece of advice that's set in quite a specific 
place, which is like for me, the song is kind of about driving up into the Pacific Northwest into Canada and stuff, um, and it has that kind of vibe to it. But but then when it when it was like, oh well, it feels like the album should open with this song, and it's a big song title, then it's kind of and then you think about everything not saved being quite dark mm. then i think it felt like the perfect kind of um response in a way it felt like a kind of answer both to both to the album before but also to the to what's been going on and the record is joyous it's meant to be it's meant to be enjoyed it's meant to be there as a kind of um, a rebuttal against the close the, the, you know the closure of of life as we knew it so yeah, yeah. And then you follow that with Wake Me Up, which seems to be the point where, say, if life is yours, it's kind of taking stock and thinking, hang on a minute, you know, this is precious, this is valuable, we should make the most of it. And then Wake Me Up is like the the, the moment where you really pull yourself together and, and message to yourself, like, like come on now, let's yeah. go. Kind of. Is that it? I mean, that's yeah, it. yeah. It's like, you know, if the life is yours sets it up, you know, it sets it up and it's just like, okay, you know. You're you driving to the party. What, you can do whatever you want, and then it's like, well, go on then. <laughs> it's the <laughs> second just like, wake me up. Come on, we're going to a party. Yeah. You're arriving at the party yeah. to wake me up. Right. I guess. Yeah. And that was our first taste of the record, really. It was first, and, yeah. and, and it, what a wake-up call it was. And, uh, you know, it, it, it did arrive at just the right moment. It's like, actually, things could get back to normal. We could experience euphoria through music again yeah. in, in a way that we haven't for a while, which is very yeah. exciting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's been amazing to play it live. Like, and we 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 actually played it. We we played a few shows the summer when we were just finishing the album. Um, and I think we hadn't even fully finished "Wake Me Up," but we were playing it live. Um, and that was an amazing feeling, knowing that it was like the first sort of taste of what was to come, and and how it connected at, at those f first few shows which were, and those were in 2021 so that was the summer of 2021 and then we finished the record in September October 2021 so I think yeah having that first taste of its interaction with the crowd was was helpful and also Wake Me Up and Life Is Yours were kind of written out of the same jam session so the, the two songs flow really well to each other because they, they're basically from the same dough <laughs> the same batch yeah as it were excellent yeah. and, and and the musical ingredients I mean there's a, a, a brilliant kind of Brit funk feel to wake me up I think I mean I don't know whether that's because of my, of my <laughs> own life experience but you know think bands like Freeze and High Tension and all they're kind of forgotten in a way but, I mean we don't, I don't know those no, bands no but you should know, check we, them out they're, they're like really Haircut great. 100 type yeah band. around the same era so you've oh, got Haircut 100 Freeze, with that yeah. kind of guitar sound as well and there was a nice kind of intermingling of music in those days where you know you'd have Spando Ballet tapping into what was going on in, in the Brit funk scene cool. you know on, on chant number one or something and borrowing a a horn section, uh, Beggar and Co. from from that scene, and then you'd have a haircut 100 using that same kind of guitar sound. Um, but I guess I mean it could be chic, it could be, yeah. um, it could be Daft Punk in a way, you know, and 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 that kind of thing, those kind of collaborations. What 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 was your take on it? What what why did you think right? Let's go disco or, you know, mm. um, I don't know. I mean, it, to, to to us, I don't think that some some of it like doesn't feel like as much of a just like as a departure as it may mm. may seem to other people to me like a riff the, the the ingredients of wake me up is not dissimilar to like my number or in, in degrees or songs that we've written before i think maybe some of the sonic palette and the and like how bombastic it is 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 slightly dialed up which might make it feel slightly different but in terms of the actual components if you were in the room and we're writing it it doesn't feel hugely different and so in many ways it's, it wasn't like there was a different set of influences and i don't think that we're necessarily influenced that directly by external stuff anymore but it, it's yeah. it's the same stuff it's you know it's still like public image limited and talking heads and you know lots of lots of new wave stuff you know and then and definitely players like nile rogers and Afri you know some west african guitar styles and yeah, um, that whole musical melting pot that led to the things that I've mentioned, but leads to folds. It, yeah, you know, it's the it's the wonderful world of, of music, of music. Yeah, you know, yeah. that we're going all drawn. I mean, that's the interesting thing. You know, you, you draw on these different influences, but they could be completely different. You know, have completely no knowledge of something, and yet, you know, that they're all you're all drawing on the same yeah. things. Yeah, in a way. it's like a, I think it's like what Elvis Costello said recently about just music being passed down and borrowed from and. You know, like there was like on the first album, Dave Cito, when we were making it, it was like, you guys sound Afrobeat. And we were like, what? Yeah, we never heard of it. <laughs> yeah, we never heard of it. Yeah. Same with like, you know, some of this like 
some of these post-punk people in, in the late 70s and 80s, you know, we know the, the big names, but some, some of the unknown heroes, it's like, had absolutely no idea. Then you put it on, you're like, oh, yeah, wow, we've ended up playing the same type, type of guitar yeah. through the, a different journey, you know. It's, yeah. it's really yeah. cool, that. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, in a way, I think of it as people asking similar questions and coming out with their own version of the answer, yeah. um, and, but arriving at kind of, same destinations or similar destinations but yeah. in a different kind of way with it you know and uh, yeah but it it communicates yeah. and that's the great thing and you you got the opportunity to uh see wake me up communicate very early on yeah and um you must be seeing that recently on the on the recent touring as well yeah um, definitely you see also it's interesting you see people singing along to bits you don't expect which is fun like everyone's been singing along to the oh no chant which actually has, wasn't the focal point of the chorus, but it, but it turns out to sort of be. It's interesting how you know you think about things in your own songwriting in a certain way. Like, oh, this is the important bit. This is like this is the key focus. And then you put the song out, and again, it's a similar thing where somebody else just interprets it a totally different way, or is attracted to something else that you never you never kind of envisage. So that that's been cool. Yeah, seeing that um go down. And we've been kind of opening the shows with it. Um, at two a.m. the third song on the record, but also our kind of second taste was it of the, of the yes. album. Um, and I mean, what were you thinking when you put this together? I mean, I, I'm going to end up citing loads of influences that or, or uh, links that that we won't have. Yeah, that's cool. Grace, Grace Jones and Hot Chip in yeah, two a.m. Yeah, cool. <laughs> no, which is a, an interesting combination. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you're pulling it off very nicely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, with 2AM, it was kind of like something that I wrote on the keyboard, and I'm not, I'm not very good, you know, I'm not great at playing keys at all. Um, so it's a very simple chord sequence, and it was a lot slower and more kind of soft and introverted in its original recording. I've got a phone recording of me at night. I mean, we might, um, anyway, um, singing it and stuff, and then I had a demo of it uh, that we were sending around, and then through, we recorded it with Miles James at a kind of slower tempo, and it was quite, it had this quite smoky late night feel to it, and then we went in and did it with Dan, and Dan want, Dan Carey wanted to record it, he seemed like quite excited about recording it, and he had a different vision for it totally, which is the album version, so he his his idea was it should be upbeat, faster tempo, much bigger keys, much more um, much bolder, um, so the song kind of went went and un, like underwent a kind of transformation when we were in the studio with Dan, um, which was interesting because it kind of it increased the the, the the tension between, you know, the initial version of the song was like it was melancholic basically, so the lyrics f- fitted the the mood of the music, whereas the the more poppy the song got and the more kind of effervescent and like bouncy it got, there was a kind of interest, interesting contradiction with the lyrics within which i think you know was cool but yeah we definitely thought about yeah hot chip and um we just wanted it to kind of slam i think once dan had kind of got it going it was just like it felt really exciting it got sent to john hill and then he did something to the bottom end where he sent it back and we listened to it my house over the summer and i remember we were all just kind of like vibing out on it a lot it was a good feeling. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, the bass is such a big part of this album, I think. You know, and it's it. Am I to think that it is a bass guitar, or is it your guitar that you're using as a bass, Janet, or or is it a keyboard playing no, that, those bass parts? That one's a bass and a bass synth. I don't remember. Did you do the bass? I think I played it? bass on that. Yeah, uh, it's a guitar. Yeah, excellent. Unless bass guitar. I vaguely remember playing bass on that at Dan's. I don't know if it got redone. But bass guitar on that. But yeah, it's hard, I don't know. Most of it, it could be a keyboard, it could yeah. be a bass. I mean, Yanis did most of the bass on the album. Yeah. It's hard to remember now, actually, some some. I quite like that, not, yeah. not knowing. Yeah. Yeah. What it, <laughs> yeah. Whatever happened to it, though, John cra- cranked, some, cranked some sort of, he brought some LA hip-hop sort of bottom end to it. Yeah, and, and there is that interesting contrast between the, the introversion um, and introspection of the lyrics and and the music, you know, because it's almost as if lyrically it's really quite open and honest and it's almost like a crisis, possibly. Um, yeah. Um, but is it a life style crisis or, or a life crisis? And, and it's, more, it's more just like when you hit the forked road in an evening. I mean, you know, it was written with that when, when there was no nightlife going on. And I, you know, I like going to the, I like going out at night and I like, I like the night time. I like socialising at night. I like the pub. I like the abandon of it. I like the you know the chaos and like you don't know where you're going to end up and stuff. And um, I was just craving that a lot. And then also, but remembering that you know often you can be somewhere really busy and like with your friends and not you can feel dislocated. You can feel melancholic within a within a social environment. Um, 
but yeah that just that point at kind of in the early hours where you've got options and choices and they can lead to you know you can you they can lead to very different results and like that kind of um there was none of that going on like that didn't exist during lockdown there wasn't any of those types of interactions which was just makes you know life boring so i think i was kind of pining for that yeah 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 and and then you go into 2001 which is kind of more partying or or, or is that pining for partying or i mean it's pining for like being for for like uh, uh, it's 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 like a sort of um a letter from the past or something from when you're younger i mean that's why it's it's titled 2001 we we so we moved to brighton we didn't move there in 2001 um, but we moved there in the early 2000s when we were a young band, and we were work that we were working on the on the music for 2001. And then when it was like I can't remember which lyric actually came first. I think there was some chorus lyrics that were there um, that were kind of a reaction to to again to sort of lockdown. But this feeling of like being pent up, being kept inside, both as an adolescent, but also within lockdown and being trapped. Like you know that feeling of when. You don't have your freedom. You don't have your autonomy in the way that we didn't. Both as teenagers, often you feel you feel that kind of that rub, and and within lockdown, there was definitely a feeling of a rub, you know. And then wanting to run out and get to the coast and have a wild weekend, like have a weekend in Brighton and 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 lose yourself in 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 every sense. Um, so the song is essentially about that. It's about tapping into that and and going out and just having one of those you know it's almost like for me it's like if Harmony Kareen or somebody was to film a, a weekend in Brighton it's meant to be that kind of that palette and that kind of abandon yeah yeah and 2001 chosen because it was the beginning of of your teenage abandoned adult life yeah I mean we, of... I was 14 in 2001 right. like that was you know and as a title it's just cool it's the start of a new millennia you know, I don't know, it just felt right. And yeah. it was called, and weirdly, the title sort of pr was, I think it was pre-existed, um, the yeah, lyrics. It was, just, it was the name of the of the loop, the riff. Right. Mm. That's always been called 2001. Yeah. And and then you've got this separate section of the song, which is, uh, is it's qualified as a, a fifth track yeah, on the I album know. that 2001 goes into, which is Summer Sky, and that kind of takes a refrain from the song and continues it in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't know. Well, partly, we didn't know what what to, whether to call the song two thousand one or summer sky. I kind of wanted it to call it. There was different. I wanted it to call it violet sky at one point as well, and like there was a absolutely not. There was more. <laughs> there was more violet sky lyrics at certain points, um, and then yeah, and then basically we had talked about like doing a chop somewhere. Like so, you had almost like when when you used to, when people used to use CD players or discmans, it would like seamlessly seek into one track into the other um so it was just a sort of playful way to do that so summer skies obviously isn't you know it isn't its own track it's the outro mm. of 2001 um yeah which I now i find really annoying when I, well i don't hear it on the radio but if i hear it playing anywhere i'm just like man my favorite bit's not on it <laughs> you know it's, it's really annoying i wish <laughs> right. i wish you just allow a little bit longer for a single you know it's like yeah yeah but which is it's good i guess because when people do hear it they'll be like oh well i way prefer the album version yeah and yeah, completely. As long as like they that. don't have it on in, on single play or something or like shuffle, that. Or yeah. shuffle. They'll, they'll, I mean, they'll never get that to outro. It on vinyl, and then there's yes. no issue. But, I mean, that's the way we're going to play it tonight. So it will seamlessly go from cool. 2001 Great. to there Summer Sky. So you'll hear it and, as, and, as it's um, intended. It, is Summer Sky or that section going to be a, a live thing that yeah, you yeah, could yeah, then yeah. extend and extend? and, and It or, is. It's becoming it, like that at the moment, yeah. We're trying not to extend it too much right. at the moment it's it's tempting because yes. it's one of those things i mean that like that bit of that song you know i've spent a bit of time on the west coast of america and it certainly reminds me a lot of that and like a, it really taps into a certain feeling i don't know what it is it's like a sun's going down it's the evening you know you don't really know it's like that kind of evening where you don't know what's going to happen but you know it's just feels good you're with good people so it's like if you conjure that in your head when you're playing it, you can just play it forever, really, because yeah. it's just like, oh, it's, just, it's really easy to play and really satisfying. Yeah. I think um, it's one of our favourite bits on the record, actually. Yeah. It, like, it, it, it came, it was it was a proper, like, it was through this session with A.K. Paul, who's Jay Paul's brother, an amazing producer and musician, and he, he plays bass on the whole song right? and, and quite a lot of the keys, and it, it's sort of almost a collab. That That bit of the song Summer Sky is kind of a collab between us and him. And it's it's cool. 
We might try and get him to join us live on it. Do you mention uh, African music and West African music, Yanis? Um, I mean, this seems like one of the obvious uh, examples of of that influence on this yeah. album. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just from a, like a loop. I think it was just done kind of on the off the cuff in the in the jam in the room that we were jamming in. You know, we'd gotten bored with doing something else, and I just did the loop. Um, and then had the vocal line almost straight away. I remember that, that it was just like we'd been playing it a couple of minutes and then had the vocal line. And then Jack was just sort of tapping along. Um, yeah, it really quickly yeah. became its thing, didn't it? Almost yeah. immediately, yeah. It was one of those, you have those kind of moments on, you know, it, they're special moments in a way when you kind of almost get gifted kind of a track. Um, and that is definitely one of those. And then... Um, it just felt great and it was kind of it felt quite different from everything else we'd been working on it felt a bit more relaxed a little bit um um yeah just a bit more kind of calm in some ways and we recorded that one with dan carey and he was quite into that you know we were discussing like some tenari when and other guitar music from like this the sahara and like from um mali and niger and stuff there's a label called sahel sounds that has like a bunch of amazing different um guitar music from that part of the world and that, tapping into that. Is that the, like, <clears throat> music from sub, sub, Saharan. Sub-Saharan sub Yeah, Yeah, yeah. yeah it's <laughs> that's <cool>. really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a compilation that, it's, it's great. Um, but yeah, they, they put out loads of great stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm quite into, the, um, I'm into that, like the style of guitar playing and it doesn't, it, it weirdly, it doesn't feel, aspects of it feel just, just innately similar to the way that um, we play guitar anyway. So, um, so yeah, so so that song just was quite. We just kind of let it do its thing, and then Dan had this. Dan wanted to just turn the um, the riff that kicks in into into this huge sort of. I mean, that was loud when we did that. Yeah, but out of a, the smallest amplifier you've ever seen in your life, I seem to remember, wasn't yeah. it that little cube thing, the little square? I didn't even. I don't think it, you, you plug it in. I, it's weird. I vaguely <laughs> remember that happening. That riff just yeah, it's soaring just, out of this tiny thing. Yeah. Yeah, he Dan's got some Dan's got some pretty amazing techniques. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's loads of really interesting sounds, and and another interesting aspect is that it's it's kind of slower. It's atmospheric, but you combine an atmosphere with a percussive feel. So it's it's kind of interesting that that combination. It's it's kind of almost you know you get slowly hypnotic, and that continues with looking high as well, where you kind of you you. It's almost like you're calming down a little after two thousand and one. Yeah, and and then but you're still hypnotized and and in a kind of trance like state somehow yeah definitely i think that you know for the record to flow like the the opening salvo of tracks up until 2001 is like it's it's you know it's um it's a there's a lot of energy and a lot of um excitement in it and then it, for the record to progress it has to kind of go into itself slightly more i mean looking high is still really really upbeat and really fun um but there is some more. There is a more introspective mood to to it. Definitely, probably in the second half, and and lyrically, generally, it is. But yeah, that that that's one that Jimmy started in the States, or did you do it when you were back here? When yeah, you, no, you? in London, yeah. This is looking high. Yeah, and, so it's, and it's, did you start on keyboards then? You know, no, uh, no. Um, both guitar and keyboards and a drum machine. Uh, yeah, it's funny actually. I found like a very early. Uh, well, you know tune into the podcast <laughs> are we allowed to plug your podcast probably not I, I don't think we can no. oh, that's a shame well John's got a lovely podcast <laughs> everyone should listen to it oh yeah yeah I've discovered this this new this old version of it well like the first demo and it's really ravey and it's completely different and that's all on keyboards but uh, yeah it was cool yeah it like, fell into place quite quickly like the guitars I was quite into like the guitars on the demo Sounded a bit like stuff from the early '80s. And yeah. uh, lyrically, I mean, looking high, looking low, we're all lost. Is that what you're singing? Yeah, like quite, quite, well, I don't know about lost actually. No, um, it's more just about looking back into the past. That it's like definitely probably the most um, nostalgic. Um, ag- well, again, like 2001 is slightly, um, but this is kind of more set in Oxford. Um, I, I, I don't know. It wasn't the most intentional, but just for me, like there was these kind of shards of memories of being outside certain nightclubs in Oxford or certain venues. For some reason, like most of the venues in Oxford that we used to go to were down alleys. Like, you know, and then... Uh, <laughs> Cobbled alleys. Yeah. yeah. Well, I and guess that's Oxford, quite, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but they're quite atmospheric, kind of. I just remember there always being like a throng of people and it would be like, 
I, I don't know, there's just something visually that sparked off that. And then this idea that we all left Oxford and like all of our friends left Oxford and then the clubs all closed down and every, you know, just I guess that ephemerality and the way that the way that life takes you from it, you know you you can't still you can't stay still in a certain moment um but what's beautiful about songwriting is you can reaccess moments and you can reconjure them into existence and then you end up you play songs every night and for me every night we play that song or we play 2001 I'm, and in my mind I'm like the imagery of that era comes back and you get to kind of re-inhabit it and then maybe somebody else listens to it and obviously has a different visual picture but it's a transference of atmosphere through the songs so you know it's been interesting writing this record rather than say the one before lyrically because I, I kind of realized like how much I thrive off the immediate contact of the time in which we're writing so like you know often I'll be writing lyrics on tour on planes like traveling a lot of the time is when I like to write because it because there's some sort of charge that's getting rubbed off and because all of that wasn't present um, in order to kind of write the lyrics, I had to just use different imaginative techniques and they were things like, oh, let's go back to thinking about this era or let's 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 write a song about an imaginary island in, in, in the Caribbean or something. It wasn't stuff, whereas the record before, I felt like I was writing directly about the anxiety that was present in myself, but also in the pub and in amongst conversations with friends. But obviously that wasn't there this time. So... That's that's led the songwriting on the lyrical level to be different, you know, yeah. and um, more more challenging in certain ways. But but looking high is an example of that. It's just about going back into the past and then reconjuring it in a song. Yeah, and it seems that your use of vocals is different on this record. That they're slightly lower in the mix. That you don't want to be so in your face necessarily. Not that they were, but um, that there's a kind of more mellow approach, possibly. You know to to the way that you've placed them within the mix of each song, and particularly yeah. on these two, on Flutter and Looking yeah, High. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, definitely. On Flutter and Looking High, they're, they're slightly bedded in. And also, I think just some of the delivery is different. There's a lot of falsetto on both these tracks. Um, and yeah, they're not, they're, not, they're not rock songs, really. So there isn't that kind of... Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's almost like the singer of these songs is different from who I am on stage, I'd say. Under the Radar is a different direction on the new record, I think. Uh, it, this conjures up Depeche and Human League in my mind. What about <laughs> you, for you? Yeah, it does. I think uh, well, I've detected slight elements of New Order in there, with the, certainly with the keyboards. Uh, this a one... Devo? I, I, was, a I Devo, about, yeah, I thought yeah. About Devo, definitely like, Devo. It's, quite, it's got quite kind of a nerdy... It's, it feels slightly nerdy to me, a little in a way. Yeah, quite square, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like the really insistent rhythm as well. Yeah. So, Lindrums as well, a, isn't it? A challenge for Jack, or you know, how does he work with drum machines and, and, well, and in the past? Kind of not great, but he seems to have uh, yeah, he embraced them now. I don't. He 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 loves talking about that track as well. Yeah, he it's, like uh, it's one of Jack's favourites actually. Um, that really worked. Sometimes I think when you combine drum machines and a drum kit, you know, it can sound like a clattering mess. If you do need or to, one can one can eclipse the other, but this seems to work perfectly. Mm. It's mostly electronic with a bit of a drum kit over the top. Yeah, right? Dan Carey's your man as well. If you want to, yeah, if, yeah. you wanna, yeah. if you want to, if you want to make a kind of Franken Borg out of like you know organic acoustic instruments and electronics, Dan Carey is your Mary That's Shelley. That's his niche. Yeah, <laughs> That's his pond. And so, how did Under the Radar begin? Uh, I think we just wrote it in the room, right? Yeah, it's just a jam, and Jimmy had the bass line. Um, which kind of morphed into the chords, and then I had the you know the sort of the the top line stuff. But we just jammed it. Basically. It was originally on guitar actually, which is yeah. good, which is good because we could switch it back live if it's too yeah. synthy. But yeah. uh, and then I don't know. I think maybe at Dan's we took it over to synth. Yeah, everything it's kind of like, woo. Yeah, it's quite cool because I'd be playing a synth, but then Dan would also be taking what I'm playing and putting it through his, his thing. Another synth. Another synth. So it's really, it's just like, whoa, you're like, what you're hearing in your headphones. It's like, mm. God, I walked in here five minutes ago thinking I knew what the song <laughs> sounded like and now it's just like, where are we going? Yeah. Uh, and it ended up there and it was great. You yeah. can get quite Christopher Nolan at Dan's. It gets quite interstellar and Stratton. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like synths upon synths yeah, upon synths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. synth. The ceiling's upside down and yeah. all that sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's not just yeah. For yeah. the whole time, I thought we were in a basement, but we weren't. We were just on ground ground level. Yeah, and I, we never it went. Feels like a basement. We never went down any stairs, but for the whole time when we were recording there, I thought we were underground. 
It's, it's, awesome. because it's quite it's a dark room, that room, isn't it? You've yeah. been in there? Uh, yes, I have. Oh, yeah, 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 quite yeah. a few times. Yeah, yeah. Quite yeah. a long time. Um, as well. Yes, yeah, for a few hours <laughs> at a time. Yeah, 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 you do lose sight of day or night. But it's quite clever the way it's set up. So it is, it's, it's almost like if you see it from the outside, it's like a shop. Yeah. Um, but you go inside and there's just a, a kind of tiny filter of light that comes through, um, which creates that basement feel. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great. It's roasting heat because of all of his equipment. <laughs> as soon as he fires it all up, it gets pretty toasty in there. But uh, it's, it's a dream in there yeah. yeah it's great it's interesting you know all those ingredients and yet under the race radar still sounds quite simple and and it is know, simple the way that this whole record sounds you know you, you you were talking about keeping it as simple as possible and yet all the ingredients are there at the same time and maybe they have more space to be heard yeah some of it you know some of it is the th- is is it being three of us some of it is is a reaction against how layered the last double album project was and how and how like how few parameters are on that both within but both across the songwriting so we went from songs like in degrees to i'm done with the world to neptune to the runner it's like every type of song we could possibly write we did on 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 those records and then within the songs any layer of sound we wanted to add we would and so obviously on this one we kind of reacted against that and we just thought let's just kind of have it more sparse, have it lighter, have it um, simpler, more direct. Um, yeah. And yeah, and that's this is a perfect example of that. Definitely. Like also, like I don't know if it's because of coronavirus, but um, my, my listening habits seems to seem to have changed. Right when we were writing, and it was just stuff that and stuff that's like that was long and quite heavy like emotionally and certainly like heavy on the production so you could hear like a band it's like wow look how many tracks we've used in the studio and like for some reason almost overnight whereas previously i'd be like wow that's amazing i can't wait to like hear all the different bits and layers i just found it really repellent all of a sudden i was like you know what i just like the simpler the music the better right now and it's something that's it's almost childlike. I don't know. It's like a re-emerging, like a child. <laughs> but uh, I just r- way more enjoyed that. And I kept a being it, you know, like a new song would come out by so-and-so. And I'd be like, no, it's so produced. I don't know. It's like, it's, there's so much mm. going on. It's too much. Then you'd hear something like, a, I don't know, just like a, like a folk artist or something. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's yeah. much better. That's yeah. what you need. So I don't know. Well, yeah, I, don't know I don't know if that will change. But at the moment, that seems to be the way. Yeah, I definitely. Yeah. I definitely agree. Also, with the with what Jimmy's saying about the emotional heaviness of stuff, it's just like, I think with what was going on at the time, I don't. You know, not often we can write some quite dark tracks, and lyrically they can be dark. And and there's songs like Knife in the Ocean and Neptune and stuff and Sahara. Those those are we write dark tracks, um, or at least heavy emotional tracks. And I don't know whether. <clears throat> We just didn't. We didn't feel like we could or wanted to go to those places as much on this in this period in our lives. It's not to say we won't again. Yeah. But I think it didn't feel right, and you have to, you have to follow your instinct yeah, and your you've heart. Got, got to follow your heart. Yeah. Even yeah. if it feels wrong at the time, definitely, because that that just means the the music you make is genuine. You know, if you're just going with with your heart and soul. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And with Crest of the Wave. You know, it, it's almost like you keep this good feeling going in a way. I think you know, there's a there's a lot of sunshine somehow on on this new record, and yeah. and you know, Crest of the Wave taps into that. You no, know, I mean, yeah. you know, okay, it mentions storm- summer, but it, it's yeah, yeah. It to me, it's also quite sto- it, it, it is like it's a stormy. There's there. It, it's like I, I mean, I just remember like just writing stuff like oh, it's like darkly tropical. There are storm clouds and stuff. You're somewhere beautiful. You are somewhere tropical. I mean, it's kind of set in Saint Lucia. I've never been there, but there's something about the, vi- the the visual presence of the mountain there that was like. There's a few kind of landscapes like that where it's like I, I'm like oh, I want to write a song there, a bit like Spanish Sahara, I guess, um, uh, or geographical places. But um, but yeah, there, there is there's the, the ocean is like is it's not it's not it's not. Um, it's not idyllic. You're not on like a package holiday. It's dark. Yeah. <laughs> it, there's darkness in there. There's, yeah. There, there's, the, the, you know, I, I, can't, I can't go through the lyrics now off the top of my head, but there's, um, yeah, it's about 
you know, there's longing and there's bit. It's bittersweet, basically. But yeah, it is. It's definitely in 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 a summer space. Yeah, yeah. I lo- and I love the idea that you just decide. Right, I'm gonna write and set something on a tropical island. Might never have been there, but I've seen pictures. It looks really cool. Yeah. And I've got an idea of what that world might be like. And yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, you think... you put yourself there and you yeah. put us there, which is very yeah. exciting. Well, I've never been there either, but yeah. I feel but, like I have now. Yeah, yeah. Well, we get now to go we there need to go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah spend all that money going there. <laughs> We just listen to Crest of the Wave now and we'd be transported thanks to Falls. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. We actually started this track like in 2012. 12. And we, 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 we partly, partly why the, this, 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 actually, this is probably worth saying because partly why it's set in a kind of tropical place or where was that we recorded it with, with um, John Omar from Jaguar Mar. That was the start of the song. We were doing it in Sydney and we, would, we were out in quite lush veg, you know, we were out in the suburbs outside Sydney along a river and we added like Balinese percussion to it um it and even as an instrumental back in 2011 it had it had that vibe to it the, yeah, the soaring yeah. seagull well, guitars we'll have and to stuff release it, it at like, some point like the, the John O version yeah it's on the deluxe Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, there we yeah. go. We are. Fantastic. Um, so if you want to hear the original version, then... But there is, like, the percussion the on the new one. Like, we took, we tried to take as many as many things that would could carry over from that original session. So it's like the percussion is people with, with uh, where is it from? Barley. I think so, yeah. It was just, uh, just... In their pants, in the sort of roasting, sort <laughs> yeah. of Sydney, wow. but, uh, whatever it was. Waranora the, River. Waranora River, covered in spiders and bugs. Yeah, we had mics just out, outside in the fronds, and there yeah, the was like spe- golden orb spiders everywhere. The speakers were just facing into a forest. So you yeah. could have it as loud as possible. It was pretty cool. It was pretty wild. That yeah. sounds amazing. Everybody's got to get the deluxe to experience yeah. that. Yes, as well. absolutely. Everybody <laughs> should buy that. But in the meantime, this is the the life is yours version. That that would you call this the official one or the, the, yes. the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you slow things down with Wild Green a little bit near the end, and um, but you get lost in the groove as well. I mean, the sound we've just heard it's kind of super funky. If if I could use such a, yeah, a I mean term. that's a dodgy old word to use. It is. But, uh, I know, I but it's also hypnotic. I, yeah, I find it like <laughs> a cross, that's the kind yeah. of word I use, and people leave the room. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, yeah, well, yeah, cl- it feels clubby. Feels sort of like like, a, like sort of garage to me a little yeah. bit, I'm, like yeah. early garage, right? When it first popped out with like, with like the hopeful dodger, you know, I don't know. Like uh, again, that was done in the re- both of these were actually done in the rehearsal room, more uh, electronically around your synths, really. Yeah, so the first, yeah, both actually around the synth, like the the, <laughs> the main riff on the sound came out of nowhere. And uh, fingers crossed, it doesn't belong to anybody else. Yeah, it seemed, when, when, it seemed when to come out it. very well formed. I was like, <laughs> hang on a minute, am I just have I just heard that in a car somewhere? So we'll see. See, see you in court. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then that that we just could not stop playing that song, and we did we did like thirty minute versions of it, and it, yeah. and nothing ever happens in it really. It's just build up, drop, build up, and it's just perfect. Mm. Yeah, I can't wait to play that in a tent at a festival. In a tent. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, a tent, like a club environment, not like a not an outdoor yeah. yeah. Like a confined, sweaty Yeah, you play that third last song or something. I don't know. It's, it's, it's I've always had that in my head. You know, it's just like it just it's you know, it just does what it says on the tin, that one. And then yeah, the second one's based around a uh, arpeggiator from the synth. From so, A synth. Sorry, Wild Green is Wild Green, yeah, yeah, yeah. the one that goes into and that, uh, yeah, that that felt like the perfect closer when we were doing it. It was that that was we played that a lot, like on a loop, and then at one point we went into a jam where it started to sort of dismantle almost, and it went into into what is the second half of Wild Green, and it was like this feels like the record finally kind of winding down, and um, it becomes like more contemplative, I guess, and um, at the end it's almost like you're zooming out of the record, and it just felt like kind of a perfect closer, yeah. But, um, I'm really glad the the record winds down and doesn't just go and go and go until it stops. I feel that that the wind down is really it's important. It's crucial. It's crucial, yeah. Because yeah. you've got to feel like it's coming to an end. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you'd just be stuck. <laughs> Otherwise, you're loop. leaving the party and the party doesn't. Yes, you know, you need the, to stop. The, the musicians we're in the control of the party, yeah, so we yeah. need to we need to like decide that it's over. It can't just keep going, and then the listeners like, oh, I've got to, got to get yeah, out. You don't want to, you <laughs> too don't, much. You don't want to leave while the party's raging. <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah. You know. <laughs> um, yeah, but they feel they feel like perfect, perfect kind of um, perfect end to the record. They certainly are. No, and and it is great because it can wind things down, but it is kind of tempting to. St- Start again. Well, uh, that's the, yeah. the idea. And, is and it, it, because it's quite contained, this yeah. record, isn't it? It's, um, and as you say, I mean, you were searching for um, a, 
a unity about it, about the sound of it. And, yeah. and I think you've really achieved that. And yet, at the same time, you take us to a few different places, literal destinations. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we get a bit of synth pop and, and we go to St. Lucia. We, we, you know, we do lots of different things. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, yeah, we didn't, we didn't want it. We didn't, there was definitely a discussion about making a record where you get to the end and you, you're ready to put it on again in a way that perhaps we haven't done that before. I feel like usually our listen, the listens are such on our on our previous records are such journeys in certain ways that perhaps you know you once you've listened to it it's a lot and you don't necessarily want to go back to the beginning um so on this one it was definitely like trying to balance the ph of the whole thing so that you get to the end and you don't feel like um labored by it you know that you feel like oh actually this is this is it's 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 easy to be here it's been great to have you here Thank you so much for coming in. It's been a pleasure to be here. Radio X.